Hello and welcome to another video. Today we will discuss why a horizontal shift has opposite sign to what we would think it should be. So for example, we're speaking about horizontal shifts also known as translations, wherein we have a function f of x that is being transformed to another function g of x. So I've tried to draw a little schematic down below where you have f of x and g of x, f of x in blue and g of x in red. And we're, in this particular instance, talking about a horizontal type of a shift, which might be a transformation with this double bar t. That's not pi. But this double bar t is the transformation taking f into g by some constant value, c sub x. The subscript x there is uh, referring to a horizontal type of movement. Now, the movement can be leftward or it can be rightward. The way I've drawn it is a leftward type of a uh, picture. But the main thing that people get hung up on here is when you have a leftward shift, why is it that the sign associated with that is positive, which is backwards to what we would expect it to be? We would expect left to be minus, whereas it's plus in reality. And then the rightward one is just the opposite of that. It's a minus where we would expect it to be a plus. And so the first part of today's video is going to try and e explain the why question. And that is, in my, all my studies, usually the most important of all questions. Because anyone can memorize a rule and then a month later forget what the rule was. But once you understand why, then it, it, hopefully you will be able to keep that in mind uh, throughout the rest of your life. Because even if you had forgotten it, you should be able to rationalize it back. Okay. So the first part is to try and address the why question. And then once we've established why, then we'll look at a, a cup, we'll look at a very simple example that you might even be seeing something similar to that in school. Um, before I get into the math, as you probably know by following my videos, I like to take a little um, aside into something scriptural. And we're talking about horizontal shifts here. Um, you probably are aware that if we did a vertical shift, something like this maybe, if I shifted this whole thing downward a little bit, it might do something like this. Okay, where this would be g of x. And if I were to pick any point on the f of x, let's say this one, and drop it down, and this point, then this distance here, we might call it a c sub y, the subscript y meaning that it is a vertical shift. And this one is in fact very intuitive because the g of x in this particular case is intuitively the f of x, all right, less that c sub y value. Okay, so this is pretty intuitive. So for a vertical shift, this is intuitive, all right? It's actually very intuitive. But uh, as we explained earlier, the horizontal one is a little bit problematic, and we'll get into that here in a second. But just making a small diversion into something scriptural, um, if you go back to the Old Testament, the Lord had given Moses and the Israelites ten commandments. So in, in the Greek, that is known as the Decalogue. And if you look at the arrangement of the original uh, Ten Commandments, it was arranged four in a group of four, the first four, and then in another group of six, the latter six. So the first four all pertain to a vertical relationship to the Lord. So for example, the first commandment said, thou shalt not have any other gods beside me. Of course, gods in that context is with the lowercase g. There's only one God. It is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then there should be no other gods. The second command says is similar. It says, thou shalt make no carbon images or idols. And interestingly, in today's culture, we can have all kinds of idols. It doesn't have to be a wooden carbon image. I was recently uh, listening to a minister speak on TV, and he said that he's just a big uh, lover of books and a collector of books. And he realized suddenly one day that his books were his idols. And so, he took all of his books and he gave them away to a foreign country to help the people in that country who are very poor. He gave all his, uh, a library of 3,000 books that he'd collected. He'd given them all away to this uh, people so that they can build a library for themselves and help the community. 
Okay, so those first four commandments are vertical and very intuitive, right? They're very, very intuitive, like the mathematics that we were looking at. Um, if you jump into the group of sixes, the, the six commandments that follow, the, they are all horizontal commandments. And let's take a look at a couple of them. So commandment six says, thou shalt not murder. And, well, you might say, well, that's pretty intuitive, but you, it's not as intuitive until Jesus comes. When Jesus comes along, it becomes quite counterintuitive because what Jesus did essentially is he took those commandments and he raised the bar to an infinite level. And what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 and 22, he said, you have heard it said, thou shalt not murder. But then he goes on and explains. He says, but if you so much as have hatred towards your brother, you've already committed murder in your heart. So you see that even though you didn't physically murder anybody, inside your heart, whatever is in your heart, could in fact be a harboring of that murderous intent, and you're just as guilty. So Jesus came along and raised the bar infinitely high. And then the seventh commandment says, thou shalt not commit adultery. And again, Jesus comes along in, Ma in the same chapter, Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 and 28, and he says once again, you have heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say that if you look upon a woman with lust, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. And you see that these are somewhat counterintuitive. As a matter of fact, so counterintuitive that the people listening to this were, they just gasped. They, they weren't sure what they were hearing because it was so foreign to what, everything that they'd been taught up to that point. And so the application is very much in sync with what we're trying to do here with the mathematics. Okay, so be good to one another and in your horizontal relationships and of course, uh, worship the Lord your God and only the Lord your God vertically, okay? Coming back to the mathematics then, why is this the way it is with the signs? And that's what we're trying to figure out. So to make the discussion real simple, I'm going to just take the simplest of all functions and look at that just because we know how to work with that very simply. And the one I'm referring to is this function, let's call this f of x, which is just x. Okay, so it's the identity linear function. It's a line with a slope of one, okay? And let's suppose I now want to shift this over horizontally by some amount, and I'm just picking a number. Let's say I want to shift it over by two. And so to do that, I'm gonna get a line which is parallel to the first line, except it's going to cross the x-axis here at minus two. Okay, so let's say this is minus one. And so what I did is in my transformation, I did my transformation just like before, this double bar t, this is not to be confused with pi, I moved it over c sub x by two units, okay? And now I can once again pick any point that I want on my first line, let's say I pick that point, and I look at the ordered pair of that point, okay? So let's say generically the ordered point has x comma y there. And then if I extend that point in elevation out to this line, I see that I have the same point that got shifted over by two units, and now I'm interested in knowing what is the new x value there. So the original x value was x here. What is the new x value here? And let me call that x tilde, just so I make a distinction be so that you don't get confused that this is not the same point as that. I'm calling it by a different name. However, Notice that they have the same exact elevation, right? So that's an important point to see. And so you see that the g as a function of x tilde is exactly in elevation the same as the f of x was, okay? Because after all, this is f of x right here, and this is g of x tilde right there, okay? So that is the same. And f of x, we know, is the identity, so it's going to be x. And now, well, I also know something about x tilde. x tilde happens to be the original x minus that c sub x units, which in this particular case, we said we're just picking a number 2. It could be any number that you want, okay? So we just said let, let it shift over to the left by 2 units. So we know that x tilde is equal to the x, which is this guy right over here, 
minus the two units. And now if I really wanted to, I can say, well, what is, in fact, what is x? Let's back solve for x. This means that x is equal to the x tilde plus 2, if I take that minus 2 over to the other side. And, well, let's look at these two guys now. Let's say, well, I have g of x tilde is equal to x, but now I know what x is in terms of x tilde. It's this right here. So that means that g of x tilde is equal to x, but x is x tilde plus 2, so I get x tilde plus 2, and now I do a relabeling, okay? So if I do a relabeling back to generic x, I get g as a function of x is equal to x plus 2. There it is. Now notice that this is a plus, okay? You may say, well, why did you relabel? And I'm going to answer that this way. Okay, so this is a little bit of an aside, but as for relabeling, suppose you have, uh, I'm, now let me call it a, by a different name. Let's say you have some function h. Okay, so h as a function of x is equal to 3 times x squared minus um, x plus 5. I just made something up. I can just as well put in anything I want in for the x. It doesn't have to be x. I can call this h as a function of baba. Okay, after all, this is baba's math corner. So, well, guess what h as a function of baba is going to be? It's going to be 3 times baba squared minus baba plus 5. So, it doesn't matter what I call it. As long as I'm being consistent, if I say h as a function of baba, then I expect all of my variable terms to be um, baba. If I call it h as a function of x, then I expect all my variables to be in terms of x. Okay? And so if I have back coming back to this point, if I say g as a function of x tilde is equal to x tilde plus 2, I can easily relabel that to any generic variable I want, and I want to go back to x, so I can say g as a function of x is x plus 2. And that's the reason why. So that's why, and I'll put a happy face there because I hope now you understand why a leftward shift produced a positive sign there. Okay, And if we were to do the same exact discussion instead of making the red line go to the left, if we made it go to the right, you would then, and I urge you to do this on your own, you would then get a minus sign there. Okay. And please do that just so that you get a little practice doing this on your own. Let's look at an example, and I've pretty much written everything out just to save us a little bit of time. But suppose you're given a quadratic function, and let's suppose it's expressed in vertex form of a parabola. So the vertex form of a parabola is here, what I've underlined in blue. f of x is equal to a times the quantity x minus h, that quantity squared, plus k. Notice that the h and the k are the coordinates of your vertex of your parabola, okay? And, and you've probably seen that, but we'll do an example if you haven't seen that. Now the question is, find the new function g of x after you do a leftward shift by five units. I'm picking some number. Well, let's, let's look at that. g of x is going to be the same exact form as f of x, except everywhere where you have an x, you're going to put an x plus five there. So really, I have a times the quantity, instead of x, I'm putting x plus the cx units. In this particular case, the cx units is, happens to be 5. Okay, and if I look at this and I put it back in the form of a minus, as in the original form, notice that I can write this as x minus the quantity h minus 5, and then this entire expression is being squared plus k. All right. Well, I, I kind of flew through that. Let's look at a more concrete example, and hopefully this will make a little more sense for you. Okay? So here's the little example. It's very much the same idea, except now I have uh, actual numbers instead of letters and variables. Okay? So f as a function of x is 2 times the quantity x plus 3, whole thing being squared, plus 4. And what we want to do is find another function g of x, which 
is the function that results from a leftward translation of f of x by 5 units. Okay? And again, I've kind of done the math just to save us a little bit of time. But what I want to point out here is that if you start by writing out your generic vertex form of the parabola, here it is. It's f of x is equal to a times the quantity x minus h squared plus k. And you just line up everything. So a is the 2, right? And the h happens to be the minus 3. And why is it a minus 3? Because you have to put this in terms, this plus 3 has to be written as a minus, minus 3. Why is that? Because this is a minus. So you have to conform it into the same form, all right? So that you can compare apples to apples. So your h is your minus 3, and your k, which is this guy, is your 4. And so your vertex has the point, uh, uh, the ordered pair, minus 3, 4. Well, let's see that. Minus 3, 4 is right over here. And indeed, that's the vertex of the blue parabola. I should have written this in blue, not red. I apologize for that. And then when you um, shift the whole thing in red over by 5 units, look at what you're going to get. You're going to get this infamous plus in here. Okay, so this is pretty infamous, right? Infamous plus because it's counterintuitive. So I'll put a kind of a evil kind of a smile there, okay? That's the plus. So everywhere I had an x, I'm putting x plus the cx. In this case, the cx is 5. And then when I clean it up, I can get x plus 8, that quantity being squared plus the 4. And now I want to conform it back with a minus sign. That's the generic vertex form of the parabola. So I have to, ha instead of writing plus, I have to write minus times a minus. And now my h is the minus 8, and my k is the 4. And in, lo and behold, my vertex of this parabola that got shifted over by 5 units, which is this guy right here, is at minus 8, 4. And then you can put your tables together and plot a few points to see how these things line up. But the main point here is that, in fact, the blue one, which was your f of x function, this is that one, uh, if you were to shift it over by 5 units, you're going to get your g of x function, which is that one. And you can take any two points. You can take this point, which I've tried to draw in the picture here, and shift it over 5 units, even though my drawing is kind of bad. But if you were to shift it over 5 units, you should be able to show that you're getting the same point on the shifted parabola. Okay? Well, I hope all of this made sense. I know I'm flying through it a little bit fast, but... Um, Hope it made sense. If not, please write me and I'll try and explain things a little more clearly to you. And as we said, that this is a counterintuitive thing. Hope that makes sense. The why part is the more important thing than the example in my mind. And probably the most, most, most important thing is our um, horizontal interactions with one another and relative to our God, our Creator. So God bless and we'll see you in another future video. Bye-bye.